Good evening. My name is Sarah Ogilvie, and I'm the museum's chief program officer. Whether you're joining tonight's program here at the museum or through our live stream, thank you for making the time to be with us. I encourage you to join the conversation on social media, and you can invite your friends to tune in now on Facebook or Twitter using the hashtag AskWhy or USHMM. And later on, our panelists will be taking questions through social media. Tonight's program marks the beginning of our fall 2017 season. During all of our programs this fall, we'll examine some of the most timeless and vexing questions that come out of the history of the Holocaust. As our founding chairman, Elie Wiesel, said almost 25 years ago when we opened our doors to the public, this museum is not an answer. It is a question mark. For the past quarter century, we have examined the many complex questions that this history raises. Questions like, why are some people attracted to extreme and hateful ideologies? Why are others willing to take extraordinary risks to help their neighbors or even people they don't know? And why do societies fail? These are challenging and consequential questions. By pushing these questions forward, the museum is building a pipeline of young people and leaders that understand the importance and the significance of the Holocaust and who are willing to take an active role in confronting the divisions in their communities, nation, and at the in the world at large. Tonight, we will focus on one of the most fundamental questions about human nature. Why do people become collaborators or perpetrators? To guide us in this conversation, I'd like to introduce tonight's moderator. Ralph Blumenthal understands the art of asking tough questions and telling complicated stories. He is the author of six books, and for more than 45 years, he was a New York Times reporter. He covered a wide array of subjects as a local correspondent, a crime and investigative reporter, and a foreign correspondent from Germany, Vietnam, and Cambodia. Related to our topic tonight, during his career at the Times, Ralph was instrumental in exposing many former Nazis living in the United States. Before I turn the floor over to him, I'd also like to mention that recently Ralph donated some of his family's materials to our collection, and you can see these materials online. And last year, he described his family's connection to the Holocaust in a piece that I think you'll want to read. It's called In Berlin, Unraveling a Family Mystery. Welcome. Thank you, Sarah. Excuse me for not turning around. Uh, let me take a moment to explain why tonight's program is particularly personal for me, and Sarah touched on it. Um, West Germany, when I reported from there in the 1960s, was crawling with ex-Nazis in the government and industry, including the chancellor, Kurt Georg Kiesinger. Uh, I was in Bonn when Beate Klausfeld snuck into the Bundestag and gave him a well-deserved slap across the face. <laughs> Later, back in New York, I began investigating the cases of Nazi war criminals who had gained refuge in America after the war. Some were brought in by our government as scientists, and some were just allowed in as anti-communists. That was the criteria. Uh, it's a very shameful history for sure. Uh, Simon Wiesenthal gave me a lot of tips, and he gave me some good advice, and I can still hear his voice. He said, Ralph, a Jew may be stupid, but it's not mandatory. The Times exposés helped pass the Holtzman Amendment barring persecutors from America. In 1985, I went down to Brazil to confirm that the bones found in a grave were indeed the remains of the long-hunted Auschwitz doctor, Josef Mengele, who lived there protected by fellow Nazis until he dried in a swimming, died in a swimming accident. Uh, what I sadly didn't do in time was investigate my own family's Holocaust history. But a few years ago, I opened a packet of letters showing that my uncle and aunt, Sillard and Hella Diamant, had tried frantically to get a visa out of Berlin 
starting in 1937. And there they are in the picture, um, Sillard and Hella overlooking uh, Sillard and my mother's birthplace of Rycha, Poland. Sillard, by the way, was a metals dealer who spoke six languages, and Hella had been born in Oswitzim, uh, later Auschwitz. Um, by 1939, the noose had tightened and the letters end. And there's a heartbreaking final letter informing them that help had been denied. I later discovered that they fled to Nitra in the uh, puppet state of Slovakia, where they were rounded up in 1942 and put aboard a transport to Lublin. My uncle Silla disappeared, uh, perhaps murdered in, in uh, Majdanek, or killed by one of uh, the police squads that uh, Christopher writes about and we'll talk about shortly. Uh, my aunt ended up in a work camp of Sobibor where miraculously she was able to escape, make her way back to Warsaw where she survived a brutal beating, uh, acquired Aryan papers, uh, lived out the war, remarried and moved to Australia, dying at 89 in 1997. Now, I had been there during the Vietnam War and never thought to look her up, which is a terrible oversight that I suffer with today. I, la I later located her stepson, who's a step cousin of mine I never knew about. Uh, and the documentation I managed to collect many years later, I ended up donating to the Holocaust Museum here. Uh, and two years ago, I traveled to Berlin to lay memorial stones called Stolpersteine at their last address in Berlin. Um, and you see them there on the sidewalk. Uh, they were, alas, not the only memorial stones at that building. They were the 21st and 22nd stones. Um, mobilized by a wonderful German woman in the building, non-Jewish neighbors turned out to light candles, lay white roses, and play Mozart on the violin. So that's why I'm especially interested in what drove other ordinary Germans to murder 75 years ago. So thank you for that indulgence in my story. Now let's get to the program. Christopher R. Browning taught for 25 years at Pacific Lutheran University in Tacoma, Washington, and then the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, where he retired in May 2014. He is the author of eight books, including the award-winning 1992 landmark study, Ordinary Men, Police Battalion 101, and the Final Solution in Poland. And here's the book, and he and uh, Wendy Lauer will be signing the books afterwards outside the auditorium. He has served as a scholar at the Holocaust Museum and received many prestigious fellowships. He has also served as an expert witness in war crimes trials in Australia, Canada, and Great Britain. Uh, Professor Wendy Lauer is the acting director of the Jack, Joseph, and Morton Mandel Center for Advanced Holocaust Studies here at the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. She has been associated with the museum since 1994. She taught in Germany, and directed an oral history program collecting testimonials of perpetrators and bystanders. In 2012, she was named the John K. Roth Chair, Professor of History at Claremont McKenna College in California, uh, where she's still active. She's the author and co-editor of three books of Holocaust scholarship, including Hitler's Furies, German Women in the Nazi Killing Fields, 2013, which was a finalist for the National Book Award and National Jewish Book Award and has been translated into 23 languages. So Chris and Wendy, thank you so much for being here. Uh, for the audience here and on social media, please share your reflections and questions on Twitter and Facebook using hashtag AskWhy and hashtag USHMM. And we will be uh, interrupting the uh, actual questioning period here for questions sent in that way. So uh, to start, Chris, let's start with you. Uh, why did individuals join the killing effort? Did they volunteer or were they conscripted? Yeah, uh, one of our problems in, in addressing that question is the fact that perpetrators came in so many forms, they traveled so many routes to becoming perpetrators, they had so many different motives that we don't have a single answer. Uh, I would say in, in rough categories we have the so-called true believers, the ideological Nazis, where they go to the killing fields because they actually believe in what they're doing. Uh, we have the experts that are crucial to any government, the, the officer corps that enabled Hitler to conquer Europe, the industrialists who armed the army, uh, the various uh, engineers who constructed 
things, uh, the doctors uh, who ran the medical profession in Germany. Uh, after the war, they all claimed to be apolitical. Albert Speer is perhaps the archetype of this. Uh, but of course, once one digs deeper, it turns out one can be an expert and an ideologue. These are not mutually exclusive and that many of them uh, were deeply committed to the Nazi project, or at least to Hitler personally, in any case. We have the middle-level functionaries, people who sat at their desks, they never saw a Jew, they never beat a Jew, they certainly never pulled a trigger, uh, but they drafted plans, they drafted laws uh, that led... Uh, those were the, the, the uh, desk murders, desk murders so-called. That, that led to the segregation of Jews, the expropriation of Jews, the exploitation of Jews, uh, but without ever physically, in a sense, contacting their victims. And we have what I would call the, the grassroots killers, the people who actually did the trigger pulling, actually ran the death camps, who do meet their victims face to face. Uh, so people participated uh, in so many different ways that we, we, we don't have a, a single answer to how the people become. All right, it's a complicated, and we're going to get, we're going to break that down uh, shortly. Wendy, let me ask you for the women, was the experience different for the women who went, and I read from your book that many more women went east than I even knew, uh, extraordinary. So women did participate in the Holocaust. Yeah, I think that um, in comparing my work to, to Chris, Chris Browning's, um, who focuses on the male perpetrators who are primarily in uniform, so mobilized as part of the war effort with regular police forces, or um, we know the Wehrmacht was heavily implicated in the Holocaust, and obviously the SS um, agencies were the prime executors of it. Um, but when you understand the Holocaust, all the uh, parts of, of the different roles people play, that, that it's a social phenomenon, that genocide is a social practice, an entire society is mobilized, men, women, and children, um, and, in, and especially in this case of what they understood to be a total war against Judeo-Bolshevism, um, that that would then entail you know, bringing women in their traditional roles, kind of aligning them with what's necessary, right? So nurses, secretaries, teachers, all of the kind of quote unquote female professions that were instrumentalized to wage this war and to carry out this genocide. Um, and the war in the East was, in addition to this Vernichtungskrieg, as the Germans called it, right? The war of destruction. It was a huge imperial campaign. So it was destructive war. That was the destructive side. And for them, the con constructive side was building this utopia this Lebensraum, um, and it was all predicated on the annihilation of the enemy um, population. And then they would build these German-only settlements. And that's where women also came into the picture and how all they... Right, so let's, I mean, you had these secretaries who worked in the offices. They were the assistants to the, uh, the administrators. Uh, you had the nurses, the Red Cross nurses. Um, and then you had uh, the concentration camp guards at probably the other end of the spectrum. So they, they, they broke down into different levels of complicity, would you say? Right, so those are the women in uniform who are trained to be guards in the camp system, which are sites of massive violence and detention, about 3,500. So that's a fraction of the overall population of women who were involved in some capacity. Um, as secretary, so a half a million women cycled through, kind of went through the Eastern territories in these various roles, as well as the wives and mates of German officials and SS officers. Okay, so let's set the picture a little bit. What did these people see as they went East? They, they were obviously brought up on the propaganda of the Nazi regime. They were uh, ideologues or idealists or brainwashed to some extent. Um, Chris, uh, what happened as they actually came into the occupied territories and subdued um, you know, the, the native populations there? Well, I would say the first wave that comes in, either in Poland in 39 or in Russia 41, many of the letters that the men write back was the appearance of the Eastern Jew seems to confirm the stereotype that Nazi propaganda had, which the very assimilated German Jew did not. So you do get a, oh, a kind of aha moment. Oh, now I, I understand. And I think that is part of what triggers these uh, rituals of humiliation that German troops carried out and, and, and so forth. Uh, but those kinds of emotions burn themselves out very quickly. The danger is when you systematize things and it becomes more than just the sport of humiliation and becomes state straight step uh, systematic killing. Uh, and that's where you get this extraordinary bringing together of all sorts of different people 
from middle-aged policemen of my unit to the Wehrmacht to the hard SS elites to people that Wendy's looking at now, border customs officials, who's ever in uniform there is, is fair game to be mobilized for these killing units. Uh, one of the, the, the key things, or just the two key things why we look at a unit like Reserve Police Battalion 101 is one of the most unlikely killers. These are middle-aged Germans, average age 40, uh, unskilled workers drafted, conscripted at random in Hamburg because they're not valuable to the war economy. Uh, they're too old to have been in World War I. They're, they're in a sense, uh, are too young to have been in World War I, too old to have been through the Nazi socialization process, and they're shipped off. And the second thing that is key is they have a commander that makes it clear they don't have to participate. So you have the very unlikeliest people as potential perpetrators with a commander that says you don't have to do it, and, he's, and the killing still Right, happens. and we're going to find out he's a very interesting commander. Uh, uh, Wendy, let me ask you this. You have looked at the, the, the diaries and the journals and talked to um, relatives and, and examined testimonies. Uh, what do you draw from this? What was the reaction of the women as they went east and, and saw conditions there for, for themselves for the first time? Um, in general, they went through a period of adaptation initially shock because while they had been socialized in Nazi Germany and they were this first generation to be so, most of these women were born right after the First World War, so they had been schooled in anti-Semitism, but they didn't quite grasp the horrors of what, was, what war was all about. So they were very happy to put on their uniforms, their nurses' uniforms, and were proud to be part, patriotic, idealist, ambitious, adventurous. Some of them wanted to you know, get better pay. The pay was better in the East. So they had all different reasons for going East. And then you can see in the memoir literature, and as I interviewed them, this period of, of, of realization of, oh my gosh, I'm actually in these sites of, of extreme violence. I mean, right as they cross the border into Poland, when they're briefed, these teachers, there were 3,000 teachers in Poland, young women, and they're told, you know, or secretaries, and they're just told by this Nazi official, now ladies, you know, don't be alarmed if you hear a little gunfire, it's just that a few Jews are being shot. Oh. Or they're in the train and they're going, a nurse who's going to Ukraine, and these SS men get into the train compartment and just start talking to them about how they had shot these, this Jewish woman and her disabled um, um, daughter. Um, and they, were, they said, we were horrified, but we didn't know what to do. We were just horrified. So I think, you know, and then some went a step further. That kind of, you know, they, they decided to get involved. You know, there's a minority. Well, it's, it's interesting. I mean, Chris, you said these, these men were not pro recruited as professional killers. In a way, that's the most disturbing part of the whole story. These really were ordinary Germans. They came from Hamburg, your unit, which was notably anti-Hitler, basically, and more liberal, correct? Um, so uh, didn't uh, the, uh, the Nazi leadership take a big chance uh, using these people uh, as their murder squads? I mean, what, made, what gave them the confidence that these ordinary, un, unprofessional killers would turn into killers? I think it was th that every step of the way, in fact, they did find compliance uh, and, in some cases, growing adaptation to it, that they could, by 42, count on even a randomly selected unit like, like Reserve Police Battalion 101. Uh, these people came had been raised, you know, for six years by now, in a, or seven years, in a Nazi atmosphere, where they had by now accepted the fact that Jews were not German, the Jews were the other, uh, but they had still been disturbed by, say, the burning of the synagogues in Kristallnacht. So how do you go from being upset about a riot to three years later blowing somebody's head off at point-blank range? And that's the transition that we, we really struggle to try to explain. Uh, and I think it is the shift of geography in part. You're in an occupied territory in the east under the cover of war where for the men going, we think, what did they think about their victims? What they were thinking about is themselves. Do my comrades accept me? Do they see me as tough enough? Am I up to this? Uh, am I doing what, what a soldier or arm, you know, uniformed policeman is expected to do in this kind of circumstance? They are trying to live up to expectations, and the government, of course, is helping to set those expectations. Uh, so it's uh, the, the dynamic of, of harnessing these people uh, is, is, in is, to a fair degree, I think the, what the degree in which all armed forces work, the, the creation of small unit loyalties, commitment, uh, and that uh, you don't want to be the one who's letting people... Right. I, I think you put your finger on it. We, we need to zero in on that moment um, when they make the shift to 
coming from their, their background, even with the brainwashing they've had, uh, to actually uh, committing these atrocious acts. Uh, Wendy, you talked about the women going east, and you know they, they, were, they were secretaries, they, they came from uh, ordinary households, they were nurses. Um, how did they make that jump to, to harden themselves when they heard these stories on the train from, from the veterans that we killed the, the Jews, we did this, we did that? Um, how did they make that, that, that switch? Well, in um, the memoir literature, they describe it as going into kind of a, a inner immigra immigration and focusing on work, trying to find various distractions and diversions. Um, uh, there are some cases of some women who had kind of breakdowns who, who, who would describe going back to their dorm room and curling up in a ball and just, because for them it was also the shock of war and they're young, they're 18 to 25 year olds, uh, most of them. Um, so that was, that just being in a war zone was a shock. But for those who, like here's Ilza Struve, um, who was a Wehrmacht, an army secretary, wanted to, you know, had a sense of adventure and wanted to, to uh, fulfill her labor duty by, by working in the, as a Wehrmacht kind of auxiliary. And she was in uh, Rovno, Ukraine at the time in, in uh, spring 1942. 160,000 Jews in Volhynia were killed. This was a massive wave of, of ghetto liquidations and mass shootings. She looked out her window one night. Ac across the street was a cinema. It's where they were holding the Jews before they were marched to the killing fields. And she knew that they were being shot. Her, there was a Jewish girl working in her office who didn't appear the next day. And um, she was really uh, outraged um, about this, but there was nothing, she felt helpless. Um, and I think that many of the witnesses, that's what they did. They just tried to you know, remove themselves from um, the scene as much as possible and find other diversions. And then as Chris mentioned, which is really important, they weren't really thinking so much about the Jews uh, you know, in an empathetic way in the, in the way that we might hope they were thinking about them. They were very, um, concerned about their own safety, about their colleagues, about the, how the war was going to go, if they were going to be victorious, about their next meal, <laughs> about, about heating. I mean, they just weren't as Before concerned. Before we go on to that uh, question of camaraderie that Chris raised, I want to just remind uh, those listening um, that uh, we are ex encouraging, uh, really soliciting questions on social media, uh, hashtag uh, ask why, hashtag USHMM. Uh, please send in your questions. Um, so camaraderie is, is a factor in what, because we're interested in what turned these ordinary Germans into killers, um, because we want to learn these lessons for, for the future. Um, um, camaraderie obviously was a factor. So um, how did that work when they got to the killing fields? Um, did they look to each other to, to uh, um, influence themselves? Uh, what if uh, people didn't, didn't go along with it? Some, some refused. Didn't that influence uh, some of the men? Talk a little bit about that. I, I think we see two things happening. One is that people are changed by what they do and what they see. So you get a process of brutalization, a process of numbing uh, as they go along. Uh, for instance, the men will describe the first massacre, and they're very distraught, they're very traumatized. And then with each successive massacre, the descriptions become much less graphic because it becomes routine. So that they lose the ability to be shocked by what they are doing. Uh, the other process is that, in fact, the unit does divide, uh, and that there emerge within the unit uh, roughly three groups, a, a group of eager killers, people that learn to enjoy killing other human beings, volunteer about for it, joke and laugh about it. Uh, and these, of course, are the, these terribly sadistic ones that are so Im embedded in the memory of survivors who still come and, and you know, can tell uh, the tales. There is a, a, a middle group which uh, doesn't want to be seen as weak or cowardly. They will do as they're told. They won't confront authority. Far more important to be, not be seen as a coward than to shoot somebody if you have to, but you don't seek opportunities. And then there's a significant group that learns to evade, uh, that you learn where not to be uh, or uh, to get a reputation that, that uh, you're squishy and so you won't be asked to be on a firing squad. Uh, and with the commander basically having made this uh, a, a principle, you don't force people to shoot, uh, a fairly significant group uh, were evaders who didn't 
They took part in all the subsidiary activities. They would guard the shooting sites. They would march people to the trains in deportation, but they wouldn't actually kill the trigger. And that give, gave them a sense, when you hear them talk about it later in their interrogations, of a great distance from events. Uh, they may they have had the moral the high ground. But yeah. they didn't think that they were the killers. Right. Uh, um, uh, Wendy, do the women break down in the same groups? Um, not in that kind of, uh, those specific categories, because again, they're not in uniform in a killing unit in, in the way that your um, men are and who are going repeatedly to a site and falling into various roles of guarding, of shooting, and so forth. But the role playing is really significant. So the ones who went that extra step and became violent and took that initiative to lash out, most, many of them against Jewish children, the most vulnerable, they put themselves in that role. They self-fashioned, in a way, into particular roles. So the wife of an SS officer who was pretty um, uh, extreme, she kind of positioned herself as like the, the missus on a plantation. Um, here's Vera Volhau. She's the wife of, of the Order Police Battalion Commander, Julius Volhau from Orpo 101. Um, she was very assertive, very, she, she was the classic Aryan, 5'9", blue eyes, athletic. So she kind of believed herself to be that ideal of that Nazi type, of that racial stereotype. Um, and there's, there's her husband. So Interesting. I Both of you have written about this couple. And uh, it's an extraordinary story by itself. And I encourage you, when you get their books, to read about this couple. Um, they actually honeymooned at a, at a killing field uh, in Poland. And she was pregnant at the time and was uh, actually participated in some of the worst atrocities. And it'll bring up a question which we'll discuss later. There she is um, on uh, what, what was going through their minds um, and how this, how this could have possibly happened. But uh, before we go on, I want to break for a moment for a video. Um, uh, Ioasis Alexinus uh, was with the Lithuanian Security Battalion who carried out mass shootings in, Bel in Belarus. And it is chilling to hear how he explained uh, events, and it's very instructive to hear this from the killers themselves. So why don't we cue that, and then we'll go on with the discussion. <laughs> No, okay, you see, 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 Sveikit, vat, kaip pasivaigė visi šitie karai ir visos šitos bėdos grįžo atjūs iš kalėjimų iš lagerių. Ar jūs apie to šaudimus jūs pasakojot žmonėm, vaikam savo? Ne. Čia gėda buvo žmonėm pasakot. Gėda. Gėda į baisų. Žiauriu, žiauriu, žiauriu padėti. Žiauriu. Um, Chris, you alluded to this, that um, some of the men refused to participate. Um, and I read in both of your books that uh, people who refused were not punished. Uh, that's quite interesting. Um, talk a little bit about uh, those episodes you describe in your book 
uh, men who refused, and the commander uh, who seemed uh, legitimately torn about his, his uh, orders uh, to kill civilians. Yes, in the first massacre, not only the men distraught, but the commander, who's never done this before, is. And, and when he's telling the men what their task is going to be, uh, the witnesses describe that he has tears streaming, streaming down his cheeks, his voice is choking. This is Major Trapp. Major Trapp. He's fighting to control himself, and he gives them a series of justifications and then explains that they're going to have to shoot everybody in the town, and then makes the offer, if you don't feel up to it, you know, you can step out and turn in your rifle. Uh, and then he doesn't go to the killing fields. He stays in town, and the men see this, that, that he doesn't, he's making them, well, he did give them the chance to, to, to stand out. He also doesn't go and see what they actually have to do. So in some ways, they, they, he was a very popular commander. The men identified with him. Uh, and it's part of, in a sense, why people, uh, I think, didn't step out is they weren't going to leave the old, the old man in the lurch. They weren't going to, you know, fail him. He had a terrible job he was assigned and they had to help. When, when the film we just saw, he referred to this as work. This is how some of the men coped with it. This was a, a bad job. I got a bad assignment. But it's a job that has to be done. It's work. Uh, and so they did try to normalize what they were doing by using this term work, as, as we, we've seen here. Right. So, so the war criminals who were tried after the war and said, I, I was only following orders. I had to do this. That's not true. They didn't have to do this. Yes, yeah, so some and many units, you didn't have somebody who explicitly made it clear, but when people tested, they found out one, one didn't. Uh, and as, as uh, very clear that in all the post-war trials in Germany, of which there have been hundreds, uh, no German defense attorney has been able to find one documentable case when someone who refused to shoot unarmed civilians suffered any significant punishment. It just didn't happen. Hmm. The problem was people testing the system, you know, can I, do I in fact... They were, they, they self-selected, they were afraid yeah. to test it. Now, Wendy, women were not in the chain of command, um, so they didn't have orders to kill. Those who killed did it on their own volition, is, is that right? I mean, they were not in the same category as, as the police battalion members who, who, who were uh, directed to participate. Correct. It was not their assignment, it wasn't in their job description, as it were. Um, so they went beyond, and ironically, after the war, in terms of their um, measuring their or or judging their culpability, they were excessive in their behavior by going beyond and killing, which should have landed them, you know, a conviction because they displayed kind of sadism or bloodlust, but um, they were not, um, by and large, were, were mostly uh, acquitted. But uh, one of the pieces that you mentioned in terms of what is turning ordinary people into killers that's interesting and that we've been doing in our work, I know your first edition of your work, really pushing us into the realm of psychology and social psychology as historians because of all this conditioning, cognitive dissonance, and all these concepts in terms of how the individuals and the social dynamics kind of wore them down, their moral inhibitions, and became part of this process of adaptation, um, which points to, to all of us in terms right. of our I mean, we're familiar with this concept of, of soldiers um, uh, motivated principally by their comrades. And we have that today in our military, that in, after a battle, soldiers will say when they committed an act of, of great heroism, so I was doing it for my, my colleagues. So this seems to be universal in, in military organizations throughout, that, that, that soldiers do it for each other. Is that correct? I think that's pretty part of basic training of, of any uh, any armed forces, and so that is is exploited and harnessed to to genocidal killing. Um, now, um, conviction rates were very low after the war. Uh, it's astounding. Some of the Wendy, the women you write up in your book, who were uh, documented as committing some of the worst atrocities, um, were not prosecuted. Uh, what accounted for, f first of all, uh, neither men nor women were properly prosecuted after the war in numbers sufficient to their acts, but women were particularly uh, exonerated. Wh why is that? I think it's a, a whole complex of factors. Um, and I think that it has to do with these gender dynamics between men and women covering for each other, legitimizing to each other why they're engaged in these atrocities. 
and in my case where you have husbands and wives, former secretaries and bosses, they're just, they're covering, they're loyalty packs that, are, that they strike during the, during the war that continue into the post-war period, and they share defense strategies, so there's no real difference between a man, you know, on the stand saying, oh, I can't quite remember, I was on furlough that weekend, the women are saying the same thing, but the added um, piece for the women who are indicted is that, um, especially outside the camp system, it's hard to get really good hard evidence. It's mostly eyewitness testimony, survivors, and that wasn't considered strong enough. Johanna Altfater, case in point, indicted 1978 for the, um, uh, uh, being a, a murder of 7,000 Jews in, in Vladimir Volensk and was acquitted, acquitted twice actually. Um, so that was a pretty outrageous case in, in West Germany. Is it because people can't believe that women would be capable of things like that? Yeah, um, I mean, even, this, even the survivors would say, such, in her case, such sadism I've never seen before from a woman. We're as dumbfounded during the war, and then the prosecutors picked up on that, or the interrogators, and said, this is, this is, um, this is um, mystifying. I, why are women behaving like this? And they want to suppress that. They want to go back to a normal society. It shows something to, to us, to society, that, that we shy away from, that we, we shun. We, we're appalled by it. And, uh, uh, I think you have this quote in your book. I, I picked it up in one of your books. Nothing makes people stick together better than committing a crime together. Uh, does that explain why husbands and wives um, sometimes egged each other on and were, were really literally partners in crime? Yes, they were partners in crime, and both in the workplace as well and into the post-war period. Many of them were also went through divorces after the war. Um, which was interesting um, in terms of the denunciation history. But yeah, so they were partners in crime, but they also, personal relationships, marital, otherwise, I mean, you know, work relationships, is very much a part of the dynamic of, of how this history unfolded. Mm. And you know, when, when um, Chris, when you said that um, uh, s soldiers in the unit could, could refuse and did refuse, there's a very interesting part where somebody said, if I had more time to think about it, I might have refused. Um, they weren't given much time to make that decision. Um, uh, Trapp, as I recall, said basically, uh, if you don't want to be part of this terrible operation, or in effect, uh, you can step out. But it came so suddenly that they didn't have time to consider it. Is that true? If they had more time, they might have uh, stepped out? Well, what we do know is that over the course of the, of the following summer and fall, increasingly numbers of people did go to their non-commissioned officer and said, I can't do this anymore. Uh, but to do that, they had to say, I can't do anymore because I am too weak. What you couldn't do is reproach the regime and criticize the policy. You had to affirm what the killers were doing as positive, manly, tough, and say, I am too weak to take part. I, I have to be excused. So you, you, in, in the very act of extra extricating yourself from the killing, you had to affirm the killers as as coded positive, and what you were doing as coded negative. Right. So there was a big hurdle to yeah. making that claim. But you said that more and more refused as the war went on, but on the other hand, more and more came, became used to the killings. Uh, and as you say in your book, um, it became less and less of a problem to, to do the killings. Yeah, I think both the evaders, group of evaders grew and the group of eager killers grew, and the middle shrinks over a course of time as, as they move towards one, one side of the spectrum or the other. Um, I was also interested to read two things in your book. One is that, um, in, uh, if I have this right, in um, March 1942, uh, 75 to 80% of all the eventual victims of the Holocaust were still alive. By the following February, 1943, um, the figures would be reversed. Only 20% would be alive and 75 to 80 percent would be dead, uh, meaning that the bulk of the murders occurred in that 11-month period. And a lot of the murders, 40 percent, if I remember this correctly, were by bullet, not by gassing. So uh, what we have to remember is that these events that you particularly talk about with your um, uh, police battalion uh, was responsible for a lot of the Holocaust in a very compressed period of time in, in murders and sh mass shootings in the field. This was not gassings and, and, and trains to Auschwitz. Yeah, I think we do have to realize that the trajectory of World War II and the trajectory of the Holocaust are not identical and that you do have this extraordinarily intense period of killing uh, from early 42 to early 43. But as a, as a policy, in a sense, the Holocaust has been accomplished by Stalingrad. Stalingrad falls in the end of February of 
three. In essence, Hitler has already won his war against the Jews when the military turning point comes. There's two years of mopping up, and particularly the great tragedy of Hungarian Jews. But most of the deed has been done by the time uh, of Stalingrad. Interestingly, that, as you say, um, as Hitler was losing his war, uh, the war, he, he was winning the war against the Jews, and the fact that he was losing the war made no difference, uh, obviously, to the fact that uh, he was stepping up his war against it, because his, his battle was really against the Jews. Um, I want to ask you this. Uh, clearly, what comes through both of your books is that the, de the dehumanization of the Jews um, was a major, if not the major, factor in the Holocaust. That these killings all depended on the fact that uh, the victims were not seen as human, right? Um, and uh, the, the callousness and the cruelty really depended on the fact that their lives were, were considered completely worthless and, and, and malign. Um, is that the same as saying anti-Semitism? Was dehumanization the same as anti -Semitism? Because some of the perpetrators were not necessarily uh, avid or, or, or malignant anti-Semites. Yeah, certainly the term anti-Semitism covers a whole range of, of degrees of aversion and hatred, so it's an awkward term to explain, in fact, a range of behavior. Uh, but we know, of course, many uh, of the German killers killed other groups, they were equal opportunity killers. Uh, the euthanasia killers then staffed Operation Reinhardt. Uh, the military in Serbia first shot high school students uh, as, uh, to fill reti retaliation quotas and then only turned to killing Jews. Uh, we know that the partisan sweeps wiped out well, 25 of the percent of Belarus, I think, is, is killed in the course of this war because of these deadly partisan sweeps and destroying village after village. So these, this, this is a case where the Nazi regime was capable of killing millions of people even if they had never killed a single Jew. But clearly in their own ideology, the Jew had a very special place in this, and clearly they had lived in a society where the Jew was not considered German. Had been ex To use Helen Fine's telling term, Jews had been expelled from the community of human obligation. These were not us, not people we had an obligation to. And in war, us, them, that means they're fair game. And this ability to, to basically expel Jews as fellow Europeans from this community of human obligation, whereby their lives don't count, they are expendable. I think you don't even have to hate them, though certainly as many did. But the key thing is you just don't care about it. Okay, so we made some progress here. If we're looking for a way to kill vast numbers of people, commit genocide, the first thing to do is dehumanize them in any society, right? Um, and um, that's something worth learning and understanding, right? That that, that is a comp key component. Could, uh, I guess it's a rhetorical question, uh, and I'll rephrase it. These killings could not have taken place if the victims were seen as human, correct? Um, we certainly have the one example where Hitler had to tread much more carefully was, of course, the, the mentally and physically handicapped relatives of Germans. Uh, and uh, he did that in secret, and then when it became public, he had to decentralize it, was continued. But there he knew there were limits. There he knew that these people still had German relatives, these German Germans. Eyes. They, they were tied to Germany in a way that most of the other victims, uh, even if they had been German, I mean, German Jews, of course, lived in Germany for centuries. Right. But you could, ex you could create a mindset whereby they were not part of the community, uh, and that is the key thing, expelling them from the community, setting that boundary. Right. You know, I was interested, Wendy, that you, you said some of the nurses started off in the euthanasia program killing, and they were not just Jews, they were de de so-called defective human beings, uh, disabled, um, uh, deformed children, et cetera. Um, so uh, it, was that the, the, the way they progressed from uh, the, their entry into the killing process? Well, the so-called mercy killing, Pauline Kneisler, one of the nurses in the so-called T4 program at the start of the war that Hitler signed off on, um, was killing 70 patients a day, mostly through injection, but also gassings in Germany itself, starting with the this case of this Jewish, or sorry, this German child. Um, but the, 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 the interesting part about um, the dehumanization aspect, I think it, it, it happens kind of at a later stage when suddenly the inferior 
idea of a Jew or of a racially defective person materializes before their eyes. They are put in a position in the ghettos when they're deprived um, and they're emaciated or they're being either being forced into ravines naked, like they're, they're um, or they're, for, they're cutting their beards, you know, they're, they're um, trying to take away their cultural identity, for instance. So there are all these ways of stripping them of their um, identity, of their humanity, but um, I think that that comes in some ways later and closer to the killing. I think before that, you obviously have the indoctrination and the schooling, which has a certain logic to it, and it's existential. And it's, that's where it's ratcheted up to, okay, I may not want to kill, but I'm going to better them than us, right? So with the war against the Judeo-Bolsheviks, they felt threatened. That was a security, that was a necessity. And so it's that fear of the power of that other but then that other is, is reduced to such a state, like the Muslim on it, it, you know, in Birkenau, um, is it not, it's easier to kill them when they're in that state that seems to affirm their inferiority. So it was like a self-fulfilling prophecy. You reduce the Jews to an abject state and then you point to them and say, look at these Jews, they're, they're not really human beings. Um, but your nurses also killed uh, German soldiers who were wounded at Stalingrad. I was uh, struck to read that. Well, that was something that had been discussed in the testimony, and there, increasingly there's more um, documentation on that. I kind of speculated in my book about that. I wanted to kind of point the um, attention to that. Um, yes, there was a special unit because of the connections between the euthanasia program, the killing of the mentally and physically disabled, and the gassing technology to the establishment of the gassing centers. Um, but the notion that German soldiers coming out of the war in the Moscow campaign who were frostbitten and had become so had become disabled, so they were in a way like the patients back in Germany who were slotted to be killed. And so but the Germans were very pragmatic, right? They talked about useless eaters, and if you're not, you know, um, an able-bodied um, person for the Reich, then, you know, then you're trash, right? Then you're not valuable. So um, this team was sent out to perform the same things they were doing back at Hadamar and Grafenek, um, doing that kind of, those cleansing operations um, with the German soldiers. But I mean, if it was such a big favor to the Reich that they were gonna get rid of these poor, useless soldiers, and they certainly weren't advertising it and saying that this is a, a, a mercy operation. So they were ashamed of it, clearly. Of course, yeah, they sent letters home to the loved ones saying that your son died honorably on the front. So just when you thought you heard all the possible depravity of, of the Nazi system, uh, here's another one. They're killing their own soldiers um, because they didn't want wounded soldiers walking around. Um, um, extraordinary. Um, now, since so much has come out since uh, you, uh, your book, other uh, 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 police battalions have, have come under scholarly scrutiny. Um, uh, what uh, information uh, has come out since that confirms or alters your conclusions in your book, Chris? Well, certainly the fact that the police battalions were a major source of manpower for killing has been confirmed and, and that many, many battalions were involved, which we didn't know about earlier. This has been one of the developments that's taken place since. Uh, I think in terms of our understanding of social psychology as an important way of getting at the idea that these are not individually psychologically imbalanced people, these are people working in a group and understanding group dynamic, how people interact under, whether it's in normal times or in extraordinary times, we do need to understand social psychology rather than abnormal psychology. Uh, and uh, much of the argument when I wrote my book was, was cast as, well, is it ideological or is it situational? Uh, and I was cast as the situational explanation versus the ideological. And I think that some of the best work since has said this is a false dichotomy. Uh, first of all, the men who go out there read their situation through an ideological lens. There is no neutral situation. It's in the mind of the person doing it. So how a German understands what it means to be an occupying uniformed person in Poland is part of the situation, but it's through the ideological lenses that he wears of German superiority and entitlement to empire and the acceptance of the Jew as other and outside the community of human obligation. So that in fact, I think what we're getting to now is that, that it, it is a mixture of of a broad set of cultural attitudes, not just anti-Semitism, but including other ideas about racial superiority uh, and inferiority, German entitlement, 
as well as the situational factors of camaraderie, of being seen as tough, and these uh, just come together. This is a, okay, a so synergy. It's interesting. So what you're saying is that it's a much more complicated picture, and excuse me if I go back to this, but you had a famous debate with uh, Daniel uh, Goldhagen years ago in this venue uh, over um, and the, uh, the uh, responsible role of anti-Semitism in the Holocaust, and Goldhagen, of course, in his book, um, uh, Hitler's uh, willing executioners posited that it was endemic, uh, ex um, um, what was the word, uh, anti um, ex exterminationist anti-Semitism that was embedded in the soul of the German people since time immemorial, and that explained it all. Uh, so what you're saying is it's more complicated. Well, I'm saying it, one is an interaction of these, and also the the attitudes are not embedded for centuries, but in fact are very sharply created in the crisis of Germany in the 20th century. Prove, be, proved by the fact that they reverse themselves and have become a a philo-Semitic, if anything, society. Correct? Yeah. Or or take the notion of of, of community, which in Germany is the term Volksgemeinschaft. In 1914, when the Kaiser gives his speech at the beginning of World War One. Uh, the German Volksgemeinschaft you know, knows no classes, no parties, no confessions. It's inclusive. What the Nazis did is had all the emotive power of that and turned it into an exclusive notion uh, of it is all the people who aren't Jewish, aren't gypsy, aren't Marxist, aren't handicapped, and it becomes an, in, an exclusive notion. Uh, so they capture the emotive power of this word of community, uh, but harness it to a racist and exclusivist uh, ideology. Uh, and so that's, that's part of the mindset. It's not just Jews, but it's a, a, an utterly racist and exclusive view of the community in all facets. Um, anyway, it's almost time, or perhaps it is time now, to go to the Q&A. Uh, am I getting an instruction to go to the Q&A now? Uh, we can do that. We have two mics set up on either aisle. Uh, you can line up behind the mic. Uh, please ask a question. Don't make a speech. Um, and. Um, <laughs> We are uh, also open to questions from uh, social media, and when those come in, we'll um, uh, accept those. And while we're waiting for people to, uh, to line up with questions, and you can start to line up, I'll take you soon. Uh, one more question for Wendy. Um, the um, most shocking part of your book are the women who really committed horrible atrocities in the concentration camps. Uh, who were out and out sadists, uh, horrible, horrible stories, and women who were mothers themselves who murdered Jewish children. And you say it's not complicated. They were able to separate their roles as mothers, and on the other hand, they were just killing uh, undeserved, undesirable, whatever, people. Um, that, that strikes me as a, as a kind of a shocking uh, finding, if, if I got that right. Uh, yeah, in, in part, uh, that they, you know, there was so much about the Volksgemeinschaft and privileging the unity of the people as the strength of Germany above individual life, um, not only against the individual lives of their enemies, but even of, of their own, of Germans. I mean, think of Magda Goebbels in the bunker um, and, and her husband Joseph Goebbels killing their six children because the regime failed. There was, for them, no future. So to take the life of your own child and obviously the killers I, I focused on of a Jewish child who was in their eyes worth even less. That's how extreme this got, this ideology. Uh, there's one scene in your book which is absolutely chilling about a, a woman who, a, a Nazi a woman who was running down Jews in, with her baby carriage, her children's baby carriage. Anyway, we have a person questioner here. Hi, I have a, a two part question, if you don't mind. First one is uh, um, uh, concerns uh, ordinary people, and a book that you published 14 years earlier about the German Foreign Office and the Holocaust. Um, did you ever um, take a look or compare the attitudes of, you know, how you dissected the attitudes of, of, of the police battalion and ordinary people versus the people at the higher realms of the agencies and departments who planned, who were involved in planning the Holocaust? Uh, did you ever take a um, Did you ever take a look at that? The other thing is, since um, your book came out, Ordinary People, in 1992, has there been any um, thing written or any evidence about um, uh, about some of the people in the police battalions or other battalions 
who, uh, when they decided they didn't want to participate in these killings, their careers did suffer? Or does that theory still hold consistently uh, throughout? Uh, okay, let me ask the, the first question. Uh, I haven't actually worked on the very top leadership uh, because I felt that was less of a problem. There, there you have what we would call behavior or attitude behavior consistency. They had ideas about Jews and they acted on them. Uh, we know what motivated Hitler. Uh, so in, in that sense, I found that I, I wanted to know how the people who implemented this were motivated. And again, if we go to the Foreign Office book, I was looking at the Jewish desk of the German Foreign Office. Uh, there were four major figures there. Uh, two of them, in fact, asked to get out and, and eventually got transfers. Uh, one was a very hardcore, eager ideological Nazi. The most interesting one was one who came in from the outside. He'd been in the cultural division of the department. He gets the job as the head of the Jewish desk. What he does is become a self-made anti-Semite. He immediately writes to all the publishers in Germany and send me your anti-Semitic books. And he does a crash course to become an, a, a Jewish expert and, and turns himself into an anti-Semite because that's his, his new job and his new role. And if he's going to be the head of this, he wants to be the best anti-Semite in Germany. Uh, so, again, you had a, a whole spectrum of how people in this, in this bureau reacted. But the scary thing is it didn't matter what their individual background does. When you look at the telegrams they wrote and the policies that came out, you can't tell who wrote what. Uh, they're all doing the same job, which is harnessing the foreign office to maximize the number of Jews that will be turned over to Germany to be deported to the death camps. And their personal attitudes differ but it doesn't alter in any way the uniform role this, this agency plays in, uh, in the Holocaust. Um, okay, let's move along, if we may, over here, first person. The photograph of the nurses was really powerful, and part of the power for me is that uh, in nursing and other professions, there's ethical codes. Um, and I'm wondering, as much as what went wrong, what went right? Were there pe ordinary people who just said no uh, to participating in all of this? And what worked? And how can we learn from what worked? Good question. Yes, that was a photo of a swearing-in ceremony of the nurses. Um, and the nursing um, profession, you know, the, the, some 300,000 of them were circulating the Eastern Territories. It's a huge numbers that are necessary for the war effort. Um, had really been taken over in large part by, by the SS. The head of the German Red Cross was an SS officer. The nurses had to swear um, their loyalty to Hitler, um, like the Wehrmacht soldiers had to. Um, and they had been um, indoctrinated with a lot of the racial ideology. Um, so they were conditioned to obviously um, prioritized the, the, the care for the German soldier so that he could be sent back out into, into combat and so forth. But they really um, had a different understanding of caring. Um, and even to the extent that the euthanasia program was called, you know, mercy killing. So, um, I mean, the, the one of the cases, two of the cases in my book of the nurses uh, who were really appalled by the wartime conditions and what they saw of the Holocaust, they just stuck to their work in the infirmary. They didn't, you know, they didn't rise up in any way. Um, they were part of a kind of cadre of nurses. Um, it's a similar kind of group dynamic. You just don't see individuals, um, at least we don't have enough documentation on that, and they don't talk about it after the war as anything kind of heroic. Um, they're very patriotic, this, this, this kind of cohort. Um, most of these young women had never been outside their villages. Uh, so this was a really, they, they met after the war um, like the vets. They would meet and, and have these social evenings and speak nostalgically about the war. So they saw themselves as part of a general military campaign. This was a, um, a, a professional opportunity for them. Many of them continued to be nurses after the war, um, but not a kind of moment of moral, you know, confrontation with something deeply moral uh, like the Holocaust. Uh, we're going to go over here. Yeah. In, in Hitler's war against the Jews, was there any distinction between German Jews and the other Jews? Only in timing of implementation. Uh, that is, they start with killing Soviet Jews, and the initial deportations from Germany 
uh, are in fact sent to e transit ghettos. They're sent to Lodz or Riga or Minsk, and they are sent sort of held there in the same way that, that you might say criminals launder dirty money uh, and they have to pass it around for a little while. Uh, in a sense, they had these holding ghettos. <coughs> and until they'd been out of Germany for nine or 12 months, then they could be sent uh, to be shot. Uh, and so you have the killing of the German Jew sent to Lodz in the fall of 41, sent to Helmno in May of 1942. Uh, the German Jews sent to Minsk are sent in the fall of 41. It is July of 42 that they're killed there. Uh, and initially, it, when the first massacres of German Jews occurred, uh, in fact, that word got back to Germany very quickly, and that's when they decided they needed to hold off and sort of hold, put these in kind of holding pens for a while and, and delay until, you know, out of sight, out of mind, uh, and then you, could, then, then you could kill them after a... a quote, decent interval when nobody cared anymore or had forgotten about them. So there was a sensitivity to, to the fact that Germans would might be more concerned about the fate of German Jews than others. So it did affect the timing, but the ultimate goal was always that, that the Jews had to be killed once they had committed themselves to the final solution. Uh, let me also remind our audience that uh, we're uh, soliciting questions on social media. Hashtag uh, ask why or hashtag USHMM. Uh, thank you. And oh, we have a question from social media. Actually, we have a couple. Um, <clears throat> we have two that are related, I think. One is from the Reverend Dr. Matthew Coomber, who wants to know if either of you have any ideas on what separated those who resisted from those who went along with the Holocaust. And Becky Frank asks a similar question How can we learn from the past of these ordinary people? who became perpetrators and make sure that we or people we know don't follow the same path at some point? <laughs> Good question. <laughs> That's an easy I one. Have to, well, I have to say on the resistance one, um, I've really found so little documentation on, on resistance when in fact one would think logically, especially in the post-war testimonies, when individuals are trying to avoid prosecution, that they would, if they had a resistance story to tell or a story of saving uh, a victim by George, it would be there, right? I mean, but it's very rare that, it's, that it materializes. Um, there's some court records from the wartime period where we see so-called acts of, of sabotage against the regime and they're dealt with. The punitive measures are really extreme. I have a woman in western Ukraine who was, um, sheltering Jews in the forests, and um, she was a wife of a Nazi a forester, and, and right at the end she was brought to trial um, in Ukraine in the German court system and, and executed. Um, so they, these are stories that are, I think, very difficult to uncover. Um, I'm working on a book project right now, and it turns out the person I most unlikely thought to be a resistor was taking atrocity photographs at a mass shooting. Um, that was a turning point for him. Being at that site was a turning point for him, and he ended up becoming a resistor um, and sheltering Jews. And I only uncover the story because I had the opportunity to meet with his family and interview them. Um, so they're, they're difficult uh, um, cases to, to turn up. Um, I think it also speaks to the enormity of, this, of the system of the Holocaust and the pressure uh, uh, that was placed on not only Germans, but all Europeans who were engulfed in this. That, you know, these are, these are um, uh, the minority <laughs> resisted um, these, these policies, these killing policies. Yeah. To that question of, you know, why did some people decide not to participate and others went along and even transformed themselves into either, eager killers? I would say that is the, the single most difficult question that I can't answer on the basis of the evidence that I've looked at. Uh, these are interrogations from the post-war period from the 1960s. Uh, the interrogators, of course, are looking for evidence against criminals and breaking down their denial. They are not trying to satisfy historians' curiosity as to why some people said no. So they don't follow those up. Uh, and you don't get a, what, what an historian's interview would have been, of course, was to take those people and to try to elicit from them much more about what it was that enabled them to, to evade. Uh, they did make a few odd comments that nonetheless are in the record, but uh, they, they're not uniform. Some would say, well, they had Jewish friends before the war, they knew Jews, uh, or that they had a landscaping business that worked mainly in a Jewish neighborhood. So they knew Jews and they knew all the stories about Jews weren't true. Uh, basically, they just rejected the anti-Semitic dehumanization of Jews. 
from personal experience because they, that was, had been part of their pre-war world. A uh, few just cited their, their ideology. I was a communist, I was a socialist, I was an anti-Nazi. Uh, others, uh, you know, I think it's, uh, what is it that gave some of them a moral autonomy to not have to conform, to not be afraid about the, the negative opinions of their comrades? That's uh, just a very, what in their upbringing enabled them, armed them to take that stance? That's one of the diff most difficult questions, I, and I wish I could answer it. Uh, but I can't. This is why we honor people like Raoul Wallenberg and Valerie uh, Fry and others because they are such mysteries. Um, do we ha have a, another question or uh, let's take one over here and then we'll go back to social media if that's okay. Uh, my name is Martin Weiss. I'm also a Holocaust survivor. Mr. Uh, Mr. Browning, I read your book, uh, Ordinary Man, a long time ago and that opened my eyes about some things I didn't know. I expected that uh, they were all willing killers, and I was glad to hear that some of them were not. But anyway, I, what I really wanted to ask you is this. We talk about the Germans, what they were doing. We know about the Einsatzgruppen, okay? Now, the Einsatzgruppen, what nobody ever mentions, there were a lot of Ukrainians, there were a lot of Lithuanians, and so on from different countries, and nobody ever mentions them. They got off scot-free. And this is something that annoys the heck out of me. The Hungarians, which I was, by the way, shipped as a Hungarian, uh, even though I was not from Hungary, they committed their own atrocities on the Russian front and, and a, a communist Podolsk or different places like that. And they threw people into the Nesta River. Nobody ever mentions that, only the Germans. And I could go on and on about different things like this. And this is something that I wish Somehow or another, somebody would do something about that because the how come they got off scot-free? You look at the history books, nobody ever mentioned. Slovakia is a good one. The Slovakia were the first people that were actually shipped out to Ukraine to be killed. And the Slovak government at the time were the one that actually almost asked Hitler to take the women and children as well. They only wanted the men for work. And this, I only found it out in the past couple of years. And you know something? I uh, live not far from Slovakia, actually, just across the border. But the point is that uh, all these things have been buried forever, and nobody ever talks about it. All right, listen, in the interest of time, let me just shorten that. Okay. You posed a very good question. Uh, have the other uh, ethnic groups, other than the Germans, been shortchanged in, in history's verdict of, of culpability? We certainly know a whole lot less about them and they have been much less researched. But to emphasize the question, you're absolutely right in terms of the crucial role these people played. If one looks at the German police in the Soviet Union behind the lines, in 1942, the second great wave of killing during this very intense period, for every German policeman, they controlled 10 to 12 Ukrainian police in the Ukraine. Uh, and most of the trigger pullers were not German. Uh, that the manpower now wasn't even from you know, middle-aged German policemen, they were, they were Ukrainians, Latvian, Lithuanian units. Uh, Himmler approves the creation of these units in the summer of 41. By December, there's 30,000 men in these units. By December 30, 42, 40, yeah, December 42, 300,000 uh, auxiliary policemen in the occupied territories that form a crucial manpower source. Part of the reason we couldn't investigate this, of course, is for years this was in the iron, under the Iron Curtain and we simply couldn't go, and there weren't trials about these people. Uh, and so it's, and also it's much less bureaucratic regime, so we don't have the paperwork. So it's, it's one of those areas where we vitally need to research it, but we are handicapped in trying to do it. There, um, we do have um, significant collections now at the museum, um, the former KGB kind of archives and these investigations. And it turns out that the Lithuanian, Ukrainian, these kind of what we call collaborators, those who were killing with the Germans um, or even without the Germans, more of them were pursued after the war and rounded up and subjected to kind of kangaroo courts or drawn out proceedings um, and executed and had 25 years um, slave labor kind of in the inner Russia, but not as not within what the idea of what we think of as a Holocaust trial. So they were branded traitors to the homeland and picked up for just their mere association with the Nazi system um, and subject to some pretty draconian measures. So more non-Germans 
were prosecuted and punished than Germans. May I just uh, say one thing uh, I'll get off? Hungary itself and Budapest, I was still home because we were taken in 44. They were throwing women and children into the Danube River. Then after that, in 44, uh, close to the end of the war, they were doing it on a mass scale. Okay, all the Jews that were left in Budapest, many of them were uh, thrown into the, to the Danube River. And the Hungarians never admitted, but finally, finally they were forced to pop, put up a, uh, a, a memorial, and guess what they did? They didn't want any statue or anything, something big. So they allowed to have shoes on the, Dan on the bank of the Danube, so the architect made up shoes, pairs of shoes, to show that it happened. Right. Before that, they would never admit it. Thank you. And that's all uh, lost in the history. We, thank, thank you very much. Um, Jude, did you have another social media question you wanted to get in? Yeah, just um, <coughs> coming back, um, to, this is a question from Becky Frank who wants to know about the images in the Hawker album and how they might supplement or complement this uh, concept of ordinary men. Yeah, this is one of the images here. So Hooker was the deputy commandant of, um, of Auschwitz-Birkenau and was these are f images from the summer of 1944 and it's really astounding. This is his personal photo album and this is a, uh, another trend in the source material and in the um, history of the Holocaust that this was very much, you know, they were documenting. They know they're making history. They're documenting it. They're very self-aware, taking a lot of photographs, including of the atrocities, despite the ban <laughs> that Himmler issued. And this photo album shows how men and women who were stationed at the camp, the women were SS auxiliaries, and these SS elite officers are carousing and, and enjoying some recreational activities, and it's coinciding with this peak period of killing of the Hungarian Jews in the summer of 1944. And the album itself is, is also interesting to compare with the um, Auschwitz album that we know of that shows the Hungarian Jews arriving at the ramp and being selected. Um, so it's an important artifact from this standpoint as well. But certainly it, it's a very blatant display. Mengele is in this, this album, for instance, of how men and women interacting kind of create a sense of normalcy and have recreational activities that we think of as kind of spirited um, camaraderie activities were you know, coincided with um, the, the, the very criminal actions that they were doing. They, they somehow could, could live in these two worlds side by side. Yeah, certainly one uh, thing that Himmler, Himmler was concerned about was the demoralization of the killers and the psychological burden on them. And in December 41, he sends out this remarkable memo and he says, after the killings, you shouldn't have this misuse of alcohol, because of course what usually happened is they got dead drunk. Uh, instead, you should have cultural evenings and you should have music and performances. And this actually happened. Here's a, uh, if we can go back to that photo. Uh, well, the, the text of, of, from the Himmler order, it's a sacred duty of every high leader and commander personally to take care that none of the men who carry out the task are brutalized or damaged in spirit or character. And in and, and Reserve Police Battalion 101, they did have these musical evenings. And we have this remarkable set of photos in which you have the, the battalion doctors with the accordion and uh, the violinist and the guitarist. And here they're putting on a show, the other show photos, photos show all the men below who are listening to it. Uh, but this normalizing, the same juxtaposition of the Hungarian trains arriving at the ramp and these men on their R&R &R at the, at the, at the, 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 the yeah. uh, you can see also in 101 where you have, we, we know they're doing during the day and enjoying a music concert at night. Uh, this goes to the whole question of ordinary people again and uh, it is part of the most chilling aspects of the Holocaust, that these were not uh, just single-minded killers all the time. They were also human beings doing what human beings do. Question. I was intrigued by that. Among the first posters that was displayed was Der Osten braucht dich. And I was struck by the fact that that dich is the more familiar rather than the more formal you and I'm wondering, because I think that's, it's a poster directed at women, do you have the sense that it's a deliberate play on women's whatever, that they use that more familiar dish rather than zish? Yeah, it's interesting um, to ponder. I hadn't really thought about that. Um, it's informal, and it could be, you know, you have 
Um, it says German women, so Frau, married, and German girls, Mädel, that East needs you and um, that you, you are needed as a resettlement advisor in the Wartegau, the, the Wartland in, uh, in ex territories of Poland. About, there were about 3,000 of these wealth, so called welfare workers, young German women. Um, yeah, the DIH could be a call, um, a more informal call, and, and, and try and do the audience of the younger women. This is being issued by the Nazi party. That's a, an interesting uh, observation. I always, I always uh, think about the use of the reflexive in the post-war statements of some of our perpetrators who say, I myself don't feel guilty. The regime is guilty. And that's an interesting grammatical <laughs> Um, also point. Uh, yes, Austin, we have a question uh, here. Yes, so um, I'm pulling together a couple of threads that you've you've mentioned, but um, you've been talking about making Jews the other, and people getting used to things, and so normalizing them. So my question relates. It's two part, but it relates to how did they do it the first time out of the box. Like when the Jews from Munich and Frankfurt and Berlin were deported in November of 1941 and were killed within a week at the Ninth Fort Massacre and were often veterans of World War I and generations of German citizens, how did that work? Because it doesn't, it's not consistent with what you're saying about they weren't used to it because it was new and they weren't other because they were Germans. And this was the Ninth Fort Massacre. And how, how was that kept secret till the 1990s? Uh, first, it wasn't kept secret. That's no, one actually it was. Because until the 1990s, families were told the people died at Riga. And it was only in the 1990s that it became, information became available that it was at the Ninth Fort. No, we have the five transport, there were the documents of the five transports being killed at Kovno. Date, we know that from earlier. You can find that in Hilberg and, and much earlier. Uh, but to the other question, why, the real issue here is how could they put them on trains to send them away from Germany? But I think we have to remember, you start in 33 and you kick them out of, kick Jews out of government jobs, out of the civil service, uh, Jewish students out of the school rooms. So you're not uh, going to your Jewish doctor, you're not going to your Jewish lawyer anymore. In 1935, you passed the Nuremberg Laws so that you can't socialize with your Jewish friends because somebody's going to say, oh, they're engaged in hanky-panky, and you could both end up you know, being accused of having sexual relations, which is now criminalized. Uh, by 38, you close down all Jewish businesses. You're not shopping in a Jewish store. Jews have moved out of small towns. They've gone into so-called Jewish houses in the big cities, living by themselves. Most Germans had no contact with a Jew from 1935 to 1941. So if you put them on a train in 1941, they've been isolated mm -hmm. and, and segregated and isolated for six years. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you send them to the east, and the, and the first killings did get back to Germany very quickly. The, the five transports to Kovno and the shooting of the first transport to Riga, those rumors spread very quickly, and that's when they decide to send Jews to these transit ghettos, hold them for a while. They, that's why they create Theresian stock, where the older Jews will go for even longer because they do, are sensitive to, to, to what the repercussions of this will be in German society. Uh, why the Einsatzgruppe you know, in, in Lithuania could shoot the German Jews? Well, they'd been shooting Jews now for, for months by the time this happened, so they are really brutalized. They've been killing, if we know from the, from the Jaeger uh, report, where every day he records you know, how many Jewish men, women, and children he's killed, uh, by November, you know, he's, in, he's well over the 100,000 mark. So, uh, that I, maybe I'm wrong on that figure. But in any case, he's been killing tens of thousands of Jews by then. So these men are shooting anybody. Mm -hmm. All right. We, uh, time is very short now, so we're going to try to get as many questions as we can get in. Uh, I'm fascinated by what you said about how it's social psychology rather than abnormal psychology that should be looked at to understand like the behavior of ordinary men in groups like in mm. Police Battalion 101. I wonder if you've given any thought to, um, you know, how should we train men in groups like in the police or in the military to prevent the kind of peer pressure or sticking up for your comrade that contributed to what happened? Uh, well, the museum, in fact, has programs for police officers and West Point cadets for exactly that reason, that we want to use what we're learning to help 
train people who will be in, in enforcement positions uh, and that hopefully if one learns from the past, we're not repeat, going to repeat it. But, uh, so th there has been a, a, a very explicit attempt to work with those training groups uh, through the museum. Okay, over here. Social psychology, uh, human nature, uh, the uh, sociological explanations or reasons uh, that we've been hearing about here are rather, rather interesting. And at the same time, I find them strangely troubling. In Germany, uh, I'm, I'm going to ask a, a question uh, to, uh, that will deal with Germany and Jews there uh, with regard to the United States and Jews here. For many years, the Jewish community in Germany, which was proportional to what we have here in the United States, about the same order of magnitude, were well accepted, permeated German society from A to Z, were highly talented in many professions, well accepted in the entertainment field, in the financial field, the medical field, et cetera, et cetera. Same is true here. But why, why do you think, if you do, that what happened to the Jews in, in a place where Jews were so well accepted in Germany um, is not possible in the future to happen to Jews here in the United States? One, I would not say something is not possible because we don't know what is possible in the future. We've seen too many things that we would th have thought impossible that one somebody can't make that statement. Mm -hmm. But I do think it's important to, to make two distinctions here. One is that in Germany between 1914 and 1933, this was a society that, that was literally pulverized by a total war, a defeat, a revolution, a, a, in hyperinflation and a great depression that all impacted, this is a space of, of less than 20 years, uh, that most societies have never been subjected in one generation to that kind of succession of overwhelming crises. And it breaks down society. Uh, and what we used to think, you know, things that would hold society together, uh, and uh, they simply snapped. I mean, this is a, this is a highly vulnerable society. Uh, secondly, of course, Germany had not had a democracy until 1919. You don't have a long democratic tradition. Uh, and it was a democratic regime implanted in part through defeat that many Germans never even accepted. Hopefully in a country like the United States, which certainly in 33 with, with Roosevelt showed that, that democracy does have some powers of resistance if it is a broadly accepted political culture and custom and tradition uh, and the, the, the rules of the democratic game are accepted by the vast bulk of the population has a resiliency that it didn't have in Germany. So that is our, our reasons to hope that it is highly unlikely such a thing could happen in the United States and why it didn't happen in the US and it did happen in Germany in 33. Uh, but as I say, I don't go into the business of saying something can't happen in the future because I can't give guarantees. Right. Thank you, Chris. You mentioned uh, last, Roosevelt and... Uh, and uh, we, wait a minute, we, we have time for one more question. So we, we're gonna we take it over here. Sorry, go ahead. Sorry, I'm kind of short, but um, hi. Um, I was motivated to come to this event because it kind of reminded me of current events in Charlottesville um, and kind of related back to what you just said about we think the impossible, like, or things that we don't think are possible will happen, but they do. Um, and that was kind of, that event was kind of directed towards um, mainly blacks and Jews. Um, and I kind of, uh, you know, seeing a woman die there, I went to the school, so. It was kind of emotional, um, and seeing someone um, die because of that, um, and kind of seeing what you said about the unity of the group over individual life. Um, do you think um, this is still kind of uh, social psychology over abnormal psychology, um, seeing things kind of happen like this um, more repeatedly than we thought um, should be happening or should be happening in general? Um, so first part of the question would be, uh, 
do we think that it's still kind of social psychology over abnormal psychology, or are the people here kind of in the group of abnormal psychology? And the second part of the question, which is more, I guess, have we learned anything um, from the past and, and seeing these types of things happen? Wow, that's a long last question, but let's try it. <laughs> All right, thank you. Thanks. Thank you for your question. Uh, thank you very much. I know it's difficult. It's a very, been very, um, these, these recent events are incredibly troubling. The museum has made a couple of statements about this. Um, some of our staff scholars have written op-eds and so forth, so I want to encourage you to, to read these and see um, the museum's response to this. And I think that the continuity of hateful ideologies, be it anti-Semitism, various forms of racism, um, you know, even, even misogyny, even, you know, the, the, we have a history of that as well at work in many, many cultures. Um, it's pretty extreme. Um, those ideologies, they exist. They, they don't go away entirely. And at some points in history, be it crises that emerge that make those societies more vulnerable, and leaders who seem to you know, legitimize them of movements who come in, or institutions that, that allow them to, to um, give them a platform. You know, so there are all kinds of mechanisms that allow them to kind of bubble up um, and, and gain some sort of traction. And it is very troubling, and that's why we just have to constantly be on guard. Yeah, I would say, uh, again, to this, getting back to say the question there of what we can say about the future, I would have thought earlier that, in fact, you would not see in the United States people aping the Nazi ritual of torchlight parades with the swastikas and Confederate flags side by side marching through a university town chanting, Jews will not replace us. If somebody had told me that was going to happen, you know, two years ago, uh, it, within two years, I would have said, you're crazy. Uh, so yes, we've broken a taboo, we have lowered the, the bar, and things are now happening that previously had not been allowed to happen and, and, and didn't happen in, in this way. Uh, on the more positive side, of course, this did immediately invoke a very, very broad reaction uh, that this was just so repulsive, it was just unbelievable. Uh, and, and I think the almost universal condemnation uh, of what happened uh, is, yeah. you know, is, is, is heartening. Uh, we wish it was unanimous, but nothing is unanimous in a democracy. And I might also add as a final word that the Germans were very concerned that this uh, uh, news would come out of what they were doing, and had there been more publicity of it, um, uh, it might have cur curtailed it, and uh, that's why enemies of the people, like the media, are needed to uh, bring these... Uh, <laughs> ...to bring these events to light in time. So it's time to wrap up. Uh, thank you, Christopher Browning and Wendy Lauer, and you'll be available upstairs, outside, signing books. A couple of last thoughts, just to sum up. I think it's safe to say that nothing we have heard here tonight suggests that the Holocaust grew out of any unique German disposition to murder. Rather, a set of complex environmental, social, political, psychological factors that could and did to various extents crop up elsewhere, as we sadly know in Rwanda and Cambodia, Bosnia, Armenia, and perhaps now in Myanmar with the Rohingya. Secondly, explaining is not excusing. And finally, let us retain our humility in the face of a terrible mystery. In the end, we must confess we understand almost nothing, but we must never stop asking the question, how and why. And now here's Sarah Oglevy to close our program. Thank you.